then I'm going to start letting people in. Excuse me. Welcome, everyone. So as usual, we will get started at about five minutes after. I'm just waiting for a couple more people to join and trying to make sure that all my social media is set up. Hi, Anne. Hey, Monica. Hi, Silas. Hi. Yay. Great to be here. All right. So let me get everything set up. Oh, I can hear in the background. Um, what do we got upstairs? Okay. All righty, so. We're just going to wait, everybody. We have Alistair Reamer on the phone. I'll properly introduce him in just a second. Am I saying your last name right, Reamer? Yeah, that's it. Perfect. I have a habit of messing up people's names. No, no I think words. it's fake. Mine's so hard. It's, um... Hey, Carol. So we have one more minute until we get started, everyone. Um, just if you guys can remember to, like, if you have other screens open, please, especially Facebook screen, please make sure that you close that one. And then if you're going to have any background noise, please make sure you mute your phones. Um, I'm actually going to put everybody on mute until we get started with the question part of our conversation. Oh, okay. All right, so it is five after and we will get started now. So welcome to the Black Study Group. This is something that um, we created as Black. We actually started it before um, Corona hit just because we wanted to um, people who are studying for their WSET level two or level three we wanted to have a place so that they can kind of study and talk about wine. And then when we moved it to the online platform, I thought it was the perfect opportunity to actually have winemakers come and give master classes. Because for me, the best way to learn is actually talking to people who are working in the wine industry. So today we have Alistair Rimmer, who works at Klein, um, Kleinzale, and he's a winemaker from Kleinzale. I'm super excited to have him. He was super excited to join. So I, I don't know, I just get double excited when they're excited to talk to us about wine and we're excited to listen about wine. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm super excited to have you here. Now, yeah, are, you, having me. It's, uh... are you on I'm losing you there. Okay, let's see. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. You sound fine to us. Okay. So can you can you tell us like um tell us your name one more time and then just give us your role at Kleinzale. Tell us what you do exactly. Yeah, cool. I'm I'm obviously I'm Alistair Rimmer. I'm the seller master at Klein Azalza. Um, I've been there for the last six uh, vintages, just over six years now. Um, yeah, we're a family-owned Stellenbosch winery. Uh, um, and my things, which doesn't sound too glamorous, but it's, it's quite a cool job because you know, we've got two arms, our vineyard side of our business and obviously the wine making. 
sort of the guy that coordinates those two sides of the business. And, and as you know, um, wine star have a have have oversight over the whole production uh, from where we source the vineyards all the way through the the end wines and the targeted areas that we're trying to send a lot of our wines is is, is cool. That's what I do at Clean and Salt. Nice. Now, how is how are you doing? How's COVID taking care of you? Is it how are you surviving? How's life? Um, it's obviously it's a bit of a challenge. We were quite fortunate in that we finished our harvest as in getting the last grapes in the cellar about eight days, nine days before lockdown. Um, by and large, we had everything pressed off by, by lockdown. So there are a lot of, we, yeah, we got everything packed away into barrels and full tanks, etc. cetera. And, um, it, it is obviously it's a challenge. We're trying to respect the lockdown as far as possible. Um, myself and some of the winemakers are going in obviously on a rotation type basis to go check the wines, take some samples for analysis uh, and check the analysis, check the malolactic fermentations and just keep an eye on things. Um, but, you know, we, we're, we're fortunate that we had all our grapes in, so we didn't have to do any major activities. And, you yeah, know, we are doing the odd bit of work, you know, just topping odd tanks or taking a tank down to barrel or so. But only ever at two people in the winery at, at a maximum at a time. So it's very cursory, more keep an eye on uh, type work than actually any major wine work. And obviously we're looking forward to hopefully in two weeks time, getting back into the winery and really getting into a lot of the 2020 wines and sort of start putting the provisional blends together and things like that. Um, but it's a challenging time. I mean, for our entire industry, the, the on trade, I think, is is taken the biggest punishment from the COVID immediately, the, the on trade and the tourism sector. But obviously, that ripples straight into the wine producers because you guys are the guys that are out there on the front line selling our wines and, and marketing our wines for us. So it's a tough time for all of us. Yeah, it's a tough time for all of us. It's the South African lockdown on wine is not making the situation any better whatsoever. Um, so just in case people don't realize, so Klein is actually in Stellenbosch. Do you actually live in Stellenbosch? So is it like just a quick run for you to go over to the winery? Yeah, it is a, a short shot. I actually live on the outskirts of Somerset West, but for those of you familiar with the area, we've got Stellenbosch and you know, obviously Paul and Franschuk, the other side of Stellenbosch, the, the uh, coastal side, the false bay side of Stellenbosch, the next town along is, is Somerset West. So I live on on the Stellenbosch side of Somerset West. I'm only about 10 minutes uh, from the winery, which makes it really super convenient. Um, Kleiner's, I think some people have got boundary. It's part of a, an original development. And the owner of Kleiner's also Quibbles Besson, who bought the property back in 1996, I think if I've got it right, um, you know, was a co-developer of the Zalza, but the Zalza, the housing estate and golf course are actually a separate entity to us, even though you use a common entrance to get to them. Um, and then Quibus owns the winery and the wine business separately. So can you tell us a little bit about um, Klein and Stellenbosch, like what makes it so special and what grapes you guys grow at Klein? <clears throat> no, absolutely. Um, you know, we are a, as a family-owned business, we suppose we would consider ourselves a medium-sized winery, uh, maybe an even slightly larger size sort of in the South African context, family-owned business. Um, we do a lot. Um, when Quibus bought the property in 96, it was a, an, it's a very old property. It, it dates back to 1682 with the first records of grapes being grown on the property. Um, and then in 1695, uh, Thomas, uh, not Thomas, Nicholas Klieff was a German immigrant working for the East Camp here. He, he uh, was given the farm. He was seeded the farm and called it Kleiner Salsa after the town of Salsa in Germany where he came from. And it's been in existence since 1695 as Kleiner Salsa. Um, and... <clears throat> We are obviously many hundreds of years down the line, Quibus bought it. He was a lawyer by trade. He grew up in Stellenbosch. 
um, and at the time was into the wine business and and needed to make a business out of it. He, he mortgaged his he remortgaged his house to be able to purchase the property and get into a business that he wasn't really that familiar with. And so we do quite a few lines of wine. We do from the ultra premium sort of small focused tiny production runs all the way to some I don't want to call them consumer uh, or commercial wines, but very consumer friendly wines and and wines that you'll find at some of your larger retail outlets like uh, the pick and pays of the world, etc., and macros and whatnot at a more moderate price point. And we try and sort of really offer value at all the price points going up the ladder. Um, yeah, what do we specialize in? We're very fortunate. We, we, we source, we, we obviously have Stellenbosch property and we, most of our, our top wines are sourced off our own vineyards uh, that we either own or lease and farm ourselves. But we also, so on the seller selection range of wines, which is our sort of entry level, more user friendly, more widely distributed wines, um, we source fruit from all over the Western Cape. And uh, that allows us to give us consistency and freshness, um, but always with a core of, of Stellenbosch fruit. Um, and in that range, we do a lot of different varieties. Uh, I mean, all the major sort of reds and white varieties that you would, you would come to see. But being a Stellenbosch property, I, I think if you had to press me on what we specialize in, I think on the red front, it is definitely Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm -hmm. um, we've done with our Shirazes in the past, and Stellenbosch does well with Shiraz too. But Stellenbosch and our specific sites and soils, I think particularly lend themselves to making really exceptional Cabernet. Um, and then I've got a, I think Kleina Salza also has quite a good reputation for making really world-class Chenin Blanc. Um, and I think that's a bit of a South African calling card at the moment, but you know, there is quite defined um, stylistic uh, differences between Chenin from say the Swartland and Stellenbosch and, and other areas. And I particularly like the style of, of Chenin we get out of Stellenbosch. That's where I fell in love with wine. So I've got a bit of a bias towards Stellenbosch, which is Stellenbosch was my first exposure to wine. And yeah, uh, now I'm back yeah, 25, 30 years down the line, I'm back making wine at a really great Stellenbosch property. So I couldn't be happier. It's like you've come full so circle. Stellenbosch was actually the first place that I landed for wine too when I came from America. So I have like a really warm place in my heart for Stellenbosch, especially Stellenbosch Cabernet. Um, and so you guys, mm. I love it. I love that you guys do the entry level and then you guys also have like the higher end boutique wines. I'll call the entry level wines like the, the crowd pleasers or the party wines when you want to have a party and you just want to get a whole bunch of wine that's nice, but you don't want to spend a lot of money. So I love that you guys have that wide range. Um, can you talk about like Shiraz? Well, no, let's go back to Cabernet. Can you talk about how the Cabernet is made? I know you guys have three different winemakers over at Klein. Um, do you specialize in like a brand or do you specialize in like red wines, white wines? Uh, we, we, we've got quite a few of us uh, involved at Klein and Salsa on the, on the wine making side of things. Yeah, I'm the seller master, so I'm obviously very uh, involved on a day-to-day -day basis on the various uh, winemaking decisions. But I, if you look at it in a, a team structure, maybe let's use a sports team, a rugby team, I'm, 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 I'm the coach uh, or the manager of the team. Uh, and, and my viticulturists and my winemakers are the players in the field. They're on the front line doing the, the hard yards to get the wines made. Um, RJ Buerte is our head winemaker. And he will coordinate the day-to-day -day running of the wineries, making of the wines. And obviously, I will be involved on a strategy sort of level, as well as tasting and blending, being that soundboard for him. You now, I've worked all over the world, got quite a bit of experience along the way. So I, I've got a, an insight to certain things that he may or may not have. And, and so we work as a, as a team. Um, so RJ oversees all the wine production. We then have three other winemakers in, in various capacities. They all report to RJ. Um, Lisa Marie uh, Geldenace is has been with us for about three, maybe four years now. It all sort of gets a bit blendy, especially with this lockdown stuff. Things, things all become one. Um, but yeah, she's been with us at least three years. I think possibly, I think four vintages at least. 
and she is RJ's right hand person. Um, but she also has the focus on our sparkling wine program. We make three really world class um, eats. Um, and then we've got actually RJ's wife, which makes a, an interesting dynamic. Uh, RJ's the boss at, at the winery, we like to say, and Natalie's the boss uh, at home. Um, but she has been brought on specifically to improve our sort of uh, external winemaking facilities. We've got Kleiner Zolza Winery at Kleiner Zolza where the main part of our production is done. Um, say 70, 75% of our production goes through the winery. But what we've, we've seen with grapes coming in from all over the Western Cape and some of them like as far up as Kukunar, which is near Lutzville, a five, six hour drive away from where we at, we found that we are losing quality um, by bringing the grapes into Stellenbosch and try, trying to process it all at our winery and other wineries around Stellenbosch. So in certain instances, we've actually got what we refer to as satellite uh, wine, wineries that we lease and that focuses on all that doesn't happen at Kleiner's also. So any process, any winemaking that happens that isn't under the roof of Kleiner's also as well. Uh oh, it looks like we might have lost you for a sec. Is it just him or is anybody else frozen? You guys are good? Yes, we're good. We're good. Okay, so let me send him a message. Let's see. I know some people were having, um, wait a second. Let's see. Okay. Are you good now? Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm, I can hear you. Okay, wait. Here we go. Okay, so you're back. We lost Where did you I lose us. you? You lost us when you were talking about, um, gosh, I'm sorry. Um, Natalie, I, I was talking about Natalie, our, our project winemaker. And you were talking about the satellite wine um, wineries hmm. that you have, and so how it's not useful to actually bring the grapes into the winery, so you guys have these satellite winemaking facilities. Yeah, I mean, it, again, and also it, as our production has grown, you know, being on the part of a, a residential estate, uh, we can't expand our facilities uh ad infinitum there is a limited amount of growth we could do and we also found we're we're reaching a point where we are slightly over capacity and, and we are needing to make logistic calls rather than quality calls so that really expanding the whole model renting seller space at other wineries um as well as you know space closer to the source of certain parcels and Natalie heads up that project and She's been with us for, for her third season now, and it's, it, we've seen a dramatic increase in the quality of the wines that are being made at those external facilities. So it's paying off in space. And then our third winemaker uh, that reports to RJ uh, is Henry Ferreira. She's been with us also her third season. Um, and she came to us just about straight out of university. I think she'd done a vintage or two at a couple of wineries, practical, uh, internship type style uh, vintage and then she was working at a small winery uh, um, in Pal, uh, where we found her and you know she is the, the 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 most junior of our winemakers but she brings an amazing energy she's an amazing person and we we are working with quite a few um uh, no she isn't a, a relation of bubbles um sorry i just saw that question pop up um she is a different ferrera scion um, but she's, she's about as enthusiastic as, as Peter is, so it is, it is very cool to have her around. And we, we've grown, you know, we are continually striving to get better. Uh, unfortunately, Kleiner Zolza quite often gets seen as a commercial brand. And people forget that mm -hmm. making great, consistent commercial wines isn't, it isn't a sausage machine. It, it, there's a lot of detail that goes in on a very large scale. But we also make some super high-end, super small lot, super interesting parcels in our family reserve range. And 
to try and improve overall quality, we are continually experimenting, trying new techniques here, how other people's approaches work with in relation to our approach. And to do that, we do a lot of smaller batch winemaking. I don't want to call it experimental winemaking because it's usually stuff that we have a pretty good idea is going to work in a certain direction. And one of those is we are now using amphora quite extensively. In fact, I've got 20 500 liter terracotta amphora from Italy. And so a lot of that smaller project style winemaking, call it experimental for lack of better words, uh, Henry heads up those projects. Is up. She keeps a close eye on them make sure that you know, the experiments as RJ and I design them or trials as RJ and I design them are carried out uh, as needed. So can you just back up for just one second, just for some people who don't mm. um, really understand what the terracotta is. So you mean like clay, clay mm. tanks. Mm. So I mean, basically yeah, you, absolutely. Have the, you have your stainless steel, you have your barrels, and then you have the clay. So can you just give us that term one more time just because I No, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll maybe just do a little bit of a segue into the, the various sort of forms that, that are, are around and are being used. You know, you, you, the vessels that you ferment your wines in and mature your wines in can take obviously just about any way, shape or form, um, but there are certain ones that are tried and tested and work. Um, the most common wine in the industry today in the modern wine industry is stainless steel tanks. It's a very neutral, very uh, clean, sterile sort of a vessel, which is, is important and has its place, especially in your bright, fresh, lighter style uh, white wines, uh, and even some of the fresher styled, uh, brighter red wines. Then you've got oak vessels, small oak barrels for maturation. You can have large oak vats uh, or fudra um, that can be many thousand liters also as a maturation and or fermentation vessel. Then concrete tanks were widely used. They went out of vogue. They're now back in vogue. A lot of people are using concrete and it has a certain dynamic, an insulation dynamic. It's got a slight porosity, similar to wood. Wood has a porosity to it. Um, and then terracotta, amphora, clay pots. Um, these are maybe the oldest wine making vessels in the world. You know, you go back five, 6,000 years to, to Roman and Greek times and ancient Egypt and whatnot, uh, they were using clay pots to store their wine in and make their wine. And, you know, it was something that when I worked in Spain in 2000 and, I've got to get this right, 2004, that uh, was my first vintage working in Spain. I'd traveled there quite a bit before. I, I remember going out to one of my growers in one of this funny little old area that I was working in. And he showed me his, the old winery that they had on the farm. And it was, but, like you know, they made a bit of wine and sent it down to the main co-op, similar sort of system to what we did. And he showed me a couple of his barrels and one. None of the wine was too interesting, but in the corner of the winery, there were these three huge, like four, five thousand liter clay amphora. And I said to him, "And that?" He said, "No, oh, we don't use them anymore. We used them till about ten years ago." And the the clay amphora dated back about five, six hundred years. And it was the first time I'd ever thought uh, about using amphora. And didn't think much of it again, but then Georgia um, with their Caveri uh, became very popular and some of the wines coming out of Georgia started to gain a lot of traction. And there were one or two guys, including guys like Ibn Saadi and the like started to work with Amphora in South Africa. And it's something, tasting their wines, there was a, a freshness and a texture to the wines uh, that I thought was quite unique. So we started four years ago experimenting with some Amphora. We started with two. And as I said, we've now got up to 20 amphora. We're using the imported ones. There are a number of different kinds. Um, and I could talk all day about amphora. We particularly have isolated this particular producer in uh, the Tuscany region of, of Italy, um, uh, Federico Minetti. And the quality of their clay, the, the, the porosity of the clay and the quality of the terracotta is something that, for me, and I'm not saying there's right or wrong here, it's my personal preference. That particular type of clay and his particular type of amphora are, are the ones that seem to be working best for us at the moment. So um, do you use that the terracotta for both red wines and white wines or just red wines? Um, no, red and white. In fact, we, we started the whole terracotta project um, as it wasn't a terracotta project. It was how do we improve our two 
upper level Shenan Blancs. We've got a very uh, and we're highly awarded and highly respected Shenans in our family reserve range and our vineyard selection range. And when I got to Clayness also, I mean, they were much lauded, some of the top stuff and juice in, in the country. In fact, the 2013, which I had no hand in, RJ made that wine, uh, was before my time. Um, yeah, we won the, the top wine of show at the Concourse Mundial in, in Brussels. And even then, so you go, well, we've just been voted the best wine in the world, best, you know, at, at a particular show, a uh, big international show. It was very easy just to stop up and say, well, whatever we're doing, we're going to keep on doing it just the same. But I think, like anything, wine is an, a living thing, and the wine production is an evolving art and an evolving science. So you've always really got to be pushing. I don't think there's anything as such as perfect wine. You know, there's always, you can always strive to be a bit better. Even if you've got 100 points, you know, you've got to aim for that extra one or two bonus points and get 101 or 102. Um, and we were kind of in that, that, that situation with our Shenans. We were making these amazing Shenans, but RJ and I sat down um, and we said, we think uh, there's room for, for improvement. We, wanted, we were greedy. We wanted more. And so we, we set out with the goal to improve our Shenans. And at the time, we were making these very uh, unctuous, rich, voluptuous Shenans that were beautiful. But RJ and I said, if we critically sort of evaluate these wines, you know, we love a little bit more freshness. We, we, we take an approach where we harvest on flavor ripeness. We don't really worry about what the sugar levels or the acidity uh, is doing. We taste the grapes. And when we taste the right characters, the right balance, I mean, obviously acidity is important. We don't ignore it, but it's, it's a organoleptic evaluation. It's not a, a chemical analysis that we make our harvesting decisions on. We said, how do we, keep that style that, that when we taste in the vineyards, because a lot of guys will either pick a bit earlier to get a bit more acidity, a bit more freshness. We said, no, we, we're happy with how we pick our grapes. We want to uh, evolve our technique to take those same grapes and give us a bit more freshness, a bit more linearity. And we looked at using some, because all our top Shenans are barrel fermented and mature. We looked at blending a portion of tank fermented wine back in. We looked at concrete eggs. We looked at uh, uh, Fudra, all techniques to maybe add a bit of freshness. And, and the one RJ and I kept on coming back to uh, of other people's wines that we tasted that we liked, uh, the common thread was there had been some level of amphora fermentation or maturation in those wines' histories, red or white, but specifically we were focusing around Shenan and, and white wines in general. And so we decided to go with amphora and Shenan but you know, we're, we're winemakers and when, when harvest starts, we're like kid, kids in a candy store. And you know, then we've got this really cool parcel of Shiraz out in the Fora farm that we lease in, in Stellenbosch. And you know, Stellenbosch and Kleiner Sols is known for its bolder, more new worldy style Shirazes. And this is a, shale, a, a Shiraz vineyard planted on shale in Stellenbosch. It's more something you'd expect to see up around uh, Ribic Bess and, and that sort of part of the world in the Swartland. And we said, well, let's try the Shiraz and the Amphora. And we had hugely brilliant results with that as well. So now, primarily, we, we do whites and Amphora, but we've got a, a couple of Shiraz ferments and we've got a Grenache also that comes out of Darling. It comes from a very old parcel of Grenache and Darling that we're doing in, in Amphora. But as, as yet, they are purely for our own interest to evaluate and see how these wines mature, evolve, um, what their longevity is before we're really going to send them out as a commercial release uh, for, for public to, to purchase, so to speak. Thank you. That was like the best conversation I ever had about clay. Um, yeah, it sounds like though they're, they're neutral and you only use them for the most part for texture. Neutral and flavors. Yes. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I, I, the amphora, even with oak, I, I think worldwide, we went through a phase where um, we liked the world, consumed lots of oak-driven wines. And I'm not anti-oak and using lots of new oak and things like that. I think wine is all about balance, whatever your, your balance is. And our shenons, our top shenons, are still primarily barrel-fermented, quite not very oak flavors, we're only using older oak barrels, but 
you know, oak influence wines, you can definitely feel they've been fermented. And, and you were, and used the word, the textural element, uh, especially on white wines. Generally speaking, we don't value texture in white wines as much as we do texture in red wines. And I think that is changing. And the big, unctuous, vis viscous sort of shillings that we're making, and there, there are a lot of great ones, and there's still a lot of great ones in that style, were great. But you, you are sometimes through the technique of getting them very ripe, using a bit of barrel, newer barrels, using a bit of maybe even malolactic, you were, you were hiding some of that mineral freshness that was hiding around it. That's what I like about the, the, the terracotta, is that they are very neutral, but they, they give you a, a great freshness. The reason why we didn't go with concrete eggs, and, and there are a lot of guys using concrete eggs to, to great success, and it's something that may work for us, but in our world and with what we were trying to do, um, the, the, the concrete eggs gave a little bit of a developed character to the wines. Uh, they, they felt a little bit tired after fermentation. And you know, for some of the guys that are, you know, and you see it in the Swart Fund a lot, again, I, I can reference Ibn Saadi, he uses some, some eggs. Um, you know, he was picking at it with much better, much higher acidities and was needing that sort of more developed texture in his wines. The eggs work extremely well for him. We were here and some of our vineyards were ripening at, at lower natural acidity. So anything like an oak barrel or a concrete egg that was going to make it even more texturally voluptuous and viscous was going to be too much and throw the wine out of balance. Stainless steel fermentation on its own was too lean and too fresh. So we needed something that gave us a middle ground. And for us, the terracotta is giving us that mutable balance of freshness, as well as not compromising on the texture, the palate texture of the wine. Is that, is that because the clay, um, is it not as, when I think about stainless steel, there's no air for the most part getting in stainless steel, right? That's why you have these really mm -hmm. lean lines. But mm -hmm. then for the clay, is it a little bit porous? Is there a little bit of air, or oxygen getting in through like the walls or like? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There is, is, is definite a porosity to it. And I think that's sort of part of the, the, the way you've got to find the balance. Uh, you know, even if you look at barrels, you know, you can order barrels, fine grain, medium grain or open grain, you know, very open, very fine. So even on, on oak barrels, your porosity is very important. And, you know, on, on wines that are going to maturation in barrel, a like Cabernet, for example, that goes into maturation in barrel for um, anything north of 18 months, you're generally looking for a very tight grain that the wine will mature slowly. But in a wine that maybe is a bit more commercial or has a certain style, um, you'll look for uh, a more slightly open grain, you know, the wines that are going to market earlier. So it is very important uh, that you, you match up. And with clay is no exception. There is porosity. It is not completely neutral and aired you know, doesn't cut air out completely, like you said, like a stainless steel tank. That's why we're using at Cleaners also the imported terracotta. It is a lot more expensive than some of the locally produced ones. Um, and the locally produced amphora are brilliant. They are truly, truly brilliant amphora. But the clay is this, a different clay. It's fired at uh, a much higher temperatures, and that opens the porosity of the clay. And we found that, again, we're getting a bit of that slightly... Um, slightly sort of for our style of wines too much viscosity and and they didn't work for us whereas they work very well for some other guys so the ones that we keyed on were these particular ones and it's a very very fine uh, terracotta and the porosity is um, i don't say the lowest of clay pots i think when if you get to ceramics and so some of the more ceramic based terracotta uh, or that ceramic based um, vessels and they are tighter uh, pore structure but as terracotta goes these are some of the tightest pore structured terracotta pots that we could find i uh, i mean i'm sure there are plenty more that i don't know about but available to us in oh south africa god. these are the best we could find oh my god i could nerd out on about every single wine mm. decision that there is let's talk about some of the other things that you guys are doing in the cellar so can you talk about some of the presses that you use like what kind of press do you use and also how much of your production is like um 
is done by hand and how much of it is done by like machines? Like do you guys hand harvest or do you guys the mechanical? And then um, kind of Yeah, rest? okay. So yeah, cleaning it's also just to give you a bit of background is about 60, 65% white production, uh, 35 to 40% red. Obviously that'll bounce around a little bit depending on the year. Um, at the moment, you know, when Quibus bought the property in 1996, it was an old sort of not very well maintained. Vineyards weren't very well looked after. So he basically did a, a, a replant of most of the vineyard on, on Kleiner Salsa, as well as did a bit of an update on the winery. And, but it is a very old building. So they sort of put some more tanks in and got some new presses. And we're still using those presses 20, what, 24 years now. Um, so we, at the moment, are just using pneumatic bag presses, so, or a tank press, as some people call them. They look like a big um, cylinder. Um, they've got a bladder in, in, in the one side, and they've got draining sieves on the other side. And you literally, you fill the bladder, you put the grapes in the press, you fill the, the bladder up with air. And as the bladder fills, it presses the grapes against the draining sieves, and your juice comes out the other side. Um, we are looking at the moment here, and obviously, yeah, with COVID, uh, the COVID crisis at the moment, things might change going down the line. We've got to see how we come out the other end of this 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 uh, situation. But we are looking at um, expanding our production capacity. Um, and we'll maybe look at some new technique, new types of presses. The obvious one that we are looking at is potentially to get two or three smaller basket presses in. We think some of them, especially on red wines, the quality of your juice coming out of basket presses are are a static sort of plunger style press. Uh, you, you get very high quality press juice. And if we've got to be critical of our current pressing system, some of our press juice, uh, especially on the red side, we feel we're losing quality that we should, you know, we could be getting you know, some really high quality juice that we are not utilizing, but we're blending away into dry reds and selling them off to other wineries. So there, there is a gap there maybe. Um, yeah, and that's that's about that. Well, there was another question I think I haven't answered. You answer, asked about presses and uh, something else, sorry. It was about harvesting, like do you guys hand Oh, the, the harvesting, that's right. Um, most of our production is hand harvested. Obviously on the shen in front of things, which is a big chunk of our total volume. Um, most of our vineyards are older, mature bush vine parcels. That all obviously all has to be done by hand. I'm not against using machine. Uh, we do do quite a few vineyards by machine, uh, but the vineyards have to be set up. And obviously the machine harvesting, in my opinion, has to be done at night. You know, there is a bit more damage to the grapes. Um, and there is a bit more juice liberated in that harvest. So that juice, as soon as it's in the, the, the machines, um, you know, uh, systems, you know, they, it can oxidize, it can, other things can start. So we only do machine harvesting uh, on a few, few of our blocks at night so that the grapes are at the winery really quickly, really early uh, in the morning and um, before they have a chance to warm up or do anything and then we've got them under control. Um, we do a little bit of Cabernet by machine. We do a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc by machine. Um, yeah, and those are the two sort of major varieties that we work with on mechanically harvested stuff. The rest, for the most part, is done by hand. Great. I don't think I have any more questions. Let's open it up and see if anybody in the group has any questions. I'm just going to unmute everyone for a second. And then if you have any questions, just please go ahead or you can just type your questions in the chat box. Any questions for Alistair? He's the seller master over at Klein Zeltzer. Zelzer, I think I said it right. No, no I'm getting there. I'm, I'm getting there. More practice, more practice. All right, so then I do have more questions if nobody else. I mean, I could talk wine all day. Can you just talk? So since we're studying Cabernet this week, can you talk about, like, if you had to say what the flavor profile was for Stellenbosch Cabernet? Like, I'm from California, so I can just tell you California is known for having big, fruity, High alcohol, Cabernet Sauvignon. So can you just give me like, 
you know, the commercial um, characteristics of Stellenbosch Cabernet? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging one. I just also, I, I suppose I've got to do a bit of, uh, um, uh, what's it? Um, I can't get the right word in my head now. Um, it's a confession here. I am a, a part a member of the Stellenbosch Cabernet Collective. I'm a committee member. So I have a strong bias towards Stellenbosch Cabernet. Um, I've also been very fortunate enough, you know, I, I've, for 12 years prior to settling back in South Africa, I traveled the world making wine. Um, I was based uh, all over. I, I worked for an Australian outfit while I was based in California for six years. Um, hang on, have you got me or have I lost you? No, I have you. I'm just gonna mute everyone for a quick second and then unmute you just because- No worries. Um, so uh, I, I've been fortunate enough to make wine pretty much every from every corner of the globe. I mean, I was based in California. I've done a vintage up in Washington State. I even made a little bit of wine in Georgia, uh, the state of Georgia, uh, in in the U.S. Um, yeah, and a boss of mine had a project there that he needed a bit of help on. Uh, that was an experience. I've worked in Australia, New Zealand. And then obviously Spain is the other place I've spent a lot of time. I, I lived in Spain and worked on a project in Spain for three and a half years. And I've done a lot of work over the, my winemaking career in Spain, other than that sort of three and a half years that I was based there. Um, so I've got a very sort of, I want to say global perspective, but I've, I've made wine in a lot of areas, worked with Cabernet, worked with lots of different varieties in a lot of areas. Um, and going back to Cabernet specifically, I, lived in St. Helena in the Napa Valley. Um, so I was exposed to all of the best of what California's got to, to offer when it comes to cab. Uh, and I love those ones. I love those big, bold, intense, really intense cabs. But at the same time, I've got a, a love and a passion for Bordeaux. You know, great Bordeaux is, is I still, and I maybe South Africa and Stellenbosch are, are hot on their heels, but it is still most probably, if you had to press me, the benchmark, you know, for Cabernet and Cabernet styled and Cabernet driven wine around the world. Um, Stellenbosch and what we have done in Stellenbosch, I think it's forgotten. You know, we've had a lot of Swatland um, press over the, the, the last decade or so. And genuinely, some of the guys up there are making as good a wine as anywhere in the world. Ibn Saadi, I've, I've referenced him a number of times. You know, and there's no denying that the modern news, Saadi, there are a lot of smaller producers up there doing some really amazing stuff. And, you know, meanwhile, back from the early days, back in the 50s and 60s, yeah, and it was probably even before that, but they weren't labeled as Cabernets then. You know, Stellenbosch started producing some world-class stuff, and I've been fortunate enough to taste some of the older iterations out of, out of Stellenbosch. And, and really just, you know, these wines were, were, were way ahead of their time back then for very little, you know, serious winemaking technique and, and process and viticulture. They just did what worked. And, and Cabernet worked. And, you know, through the 70s, you know, you look at what uh, Christo Lerich, who is, is the chairman of the Stellenbosch Cabernet Collective. Um, his dad, Etienne, out at, at Rustenburg. I mean, some of those old Rustenburgs are some of the best wines we ever produced. Uh, you got Jan Bullant, uh, Kanonkop, uh, Risten Fjerda. Yeah, there were so many great older cabs through the 70s and 80s. And then, yeah, come the 90s, we were back on the world scene and what was popular then and what was in vogue was uh, well, one was Mr. Robert Parker, and he's a phenomenal wine taster and a great guy. I, I have a lot of time for him. And he's very consistent in the profile of wine he likes. He doesn't bounce around. And, you know, there, there's pros and cons to that. But he had a particular style of wine that he liked. And, you know, the rise of California, you know, California had been booming from the 70s, you know, in the judgment of Paris. And... They were chasing their most popular critic and Australia started entering the world scene and their most popular wines were big turbocharged Shirazes. So South Africa in the early 90s and mid 90s started looking at what was, was hot, so to speak. And that style of wine was hot. California and Australia were the two leading lights from the new world. 
and I think we moved away from making fresh, tight, focused Cabernet to something that was more emulating or trying to emulate what Napa and, and to an extent Australia was doing. And we made some amazing wines, make no mistake. We've made some truly amazing wines through that. But I think we were trying too hard to copy rather than to learn the lessons from what Napa is doing right and apply to what we have here. And what has emerged over the last decade and a half to two decades is a slight, and I think that's what's exciting about the South African wine industry. I truly believe you have all the places I've made wine. The most exciting place to be making wine is South Africa. And what we are doing in Stellenbosch at the moment is, is, is rediscovering our own identity. We are not making Bordeaux. We are not making Napa. We are making Stellenbosch now. And that identity has emerged over the last couple of decades. And if I look, and yeah, obviously we're lucky, we've had two amazing vintages of recent time uh, that were rate as some of the greatest vintages uh, in, in the history of Stellenbosch being 2015 and 2017. Um, some really, truly amazing ones. Not to say to discount the vintages either side of those two, but those two were, were pretty, pretty damn amazing. And I've been fortunate enough in my position on the committee to taste large swaths of wines that are my colleagues have produced from 2015 and 2017, Stellenbosch Cabernet specifically. And we have now really started to hit the nail on the head. And I, what I think is exciting, and come back all the way to the original question, sorry, I talked too much. But to come back to your original question, what does Stellenbosch Cabernet taste like? Uh, I think we've got a really cool uh, midway you know, we, when, you, when you smell a glass of Cabernet that we just opened or a younger Cabernet from, from, from Stellenbosch, a lot of people would be fooled into thinking they've got Napa in their glass. We've got a great fruit intensity, a dark cassis, uh, black currant, intense uh, fruit-driven sort of nose. But judged well, you do get those beautiful, you know, fine bossy, I don't want to say herbaceous because I can, can, can say green, but there is high down there, but there's a great fruit intensity on the nose, but the palates, and this is where South, South Africa gets it right. We've got that intensity that Napa has, but, and not to knock Napa because I love Napa, but if you've got to be critical again, sometimes they are a little bit blunt on the palate. Yeah, they, they're intense and they're beautiful, but they sort of attack your palate a little bit and they can be a little bit one note on the palate and a little bit heavy and a little bit cloying when they are out of balance. Stellenbosch in particular, when we get it right, has unparalleled freshness to go with fruit intensity. Bordeaux, they play the, the, the game on the other side. The, the freshness and the vibrance is, is what's there. But the white wines can be quite tightly coiled when they're young and quite unpleasant to look at. Uh, and they don't have that lusciousness on fruit intensity that, say, the Napa wines have. And so they've got to try to fight that balance on the other side. I think Stellenbosch has got the best of both worlds. We've got that intensity of fruit that Napa has, but we've got the freshness and the brightness and the, the linearity and the, the, the elegance of, of great Bordeaux when we get it right. Yeah, I agree 100%. That's exactly how I describe Stellenbosch Cabernet. It's kind of, for me, it's in the middle of Bordeaux and American Napa Valley Cabernet right in the middle. You get that fruitiness with that earth. It's, it's just reminds me of South Africa. Ah, any more questions? So let's see, we have, we have a question from Mo. He put it in the chat and Mo, I don't know if you want me to unmute you and you can ask it yourself or I'll ask it for you. Uh, let's see. Hi, okay. Ronnie. Hi, Alistair. Hi, mate. Okay. So how are you? Um, two, two questions. Um, uh, so volume wise, what is Klein is also looking at uh, when you're saying that you have so much Shannon and then in relation to the Cabernet, um, what is your opinion on the new, the new cab that is coming out of South Africa? Also the cab Sinzo blends and do you think that Sinzo is now going to be one of the leading lights in the South African wine industry? Uh, there's some amazing examples out there, especially um, at prime spots from uh, Francois. Um, what, what is your opinion there? Okay, I will 
when you say I'll start with the volume question, I'll try and them. If I miss any of them, just sort of prompt me for, for ones that I'm missing. But the volume sort of things, I mean, Kleiner sells a, you know, we've almost got two halves to our business, sort of our own grown fruit, which is sort of focused on our premium wines, which is most probably in total production, not just on Shen. And, you know, in the region of, of I don't know, 500,000 bottles, our vineyard selection range wines, the black labels, which some of you guys might be familiar with. Um, he has Shannon of ours in that same range. Yeah, those wines are made in fairly decent volumes. You know, the Shannon, we do about 120,000 bottles a year. The Cabernet, we do between 90 and 100,000 bottles on a year, on a reasonable year. So they're made in decent volumes. Um, we then have our cellar selection wines and then a range of wines that we do not under the Cleaners Dolza label for export markets to, for example, the British shoe retail, the British supermarkets. Um, those are under a different brand, still our own brand, not like a leaping zebra type brand. It is, uh, it's a brand called Zolza. It looks very different to Kleiner Zolza, um, and, but we only make them. We don't want to cross contaminate our Kleiner Zolza brand with you know, wines that we make specifically for you know, big supermarket groups in a different style. Um, yeah, those wines are quite big. I mean, if you add up those total volume of that production, it's just probably around about you know, call it 200,000 cases. So two, two and a half million bottles that we do for other parts of the world under other brands. And then the Kleiner Zolza wines, which is probably in total, if you include the seller selection wines, be about another million bottles in, in total. Um, the new South African Cabernet, I, I think I touched on it in my previous sort of answer. I love where mm, Stellenbosch Cabernet is moving at the moment. Um, we truly, truly are finding uh, that balance and and we made the big bold statement wines and that those are important too also to get your foot in the door as a relatively although we've been making wine for 350 odd years you have to make a statement because we we've only been in the in the the, the international game for the last 25 years um, and so those big bolder sort of more statementy sort of wines are important but I think we're now starting to see a real uh, focus on on on, on elegance um, and elegance is being valued and elegance mustn't be confused with watery. I think that was in the old days, 10 years ago, if you said well, my wine's elegant, it was a euphemism for it's a bit dilute and not, not, not intensely flavored. Yeah, but I think we are now starting to understand that you can have intensity of flavor, depth of flavor and still remain fresh and elegant on the palate. So, I mean, Burgundy is you know, using Pinot Noir as an analogy here, but Burgundy is most probably the most uh, uh, prime example of that. You know, they are the lightest, brightest, most beautiful wines in the world, but intensity they are not lacking in. And um, you know, I think that could be said about Great Bordeaux as well. Yeah, some of those Great Bordeaux are are alarmingly fresh and bright. And I think we are finding that balance in South Africa. And then touching on your Sinso, uh, a light variety. I love Sinso. I think it's great. Uh, I think a bit like Chenin Blanc, there is a, a huge amount of older material in the country. You know, Sinso was widely, widely planted at one point in time. And I think just like Chenin, and I think a colleague of mine, Brevet Ratz, has touched on it a bit. Just because it's old vineyards doesn't mean it's necessarily good. It, it does have to be on the right sides. And you know, you, we can't forget that with Chenin, and with Simso, a lot of those clones that were planted uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago were not planted because they were going to make high quality wine. They were going to planted purely because they're going to make high volume of wine. And um, I think obviously as these vines have matured, the yields have, have, have lowered and they are more in balance now as older mature passes, but sometimes not planted on the best site. So I think while Simso is doing some great stuff, we sell some old sites and you touch on it. It's the right pockets of Sinso that are going to be good. We mustn't just start making Sinso for Sinso's sake. Um, it's got to be the right Sinso on the right sites. Um, and going forward, hopefully we'll be planting some new Sinso vineyards to be the old vineyards of the future, um, that we start marrying them up on better sites um, yeah, that are going to give high quality wine. I think obviously the history of Cabernet and Stellenbosch and Sinso are intertwined. But you've also got to remember our wine production back then. You know, a lot of the stuff was harvested together and when it was ripe, um, you know, and when they were picking Cabernet at much lower sugar levels, much, much lower sugar levels, 
um, the wines are much greener. Yeah, we always talk about the older cabs um, needing five, ten years before you even approached them and thought about opening them. Um, and I think the Cinso was the tool that harvested them together. Cinso brought the softness and the roundness and just softened the edgy Cabernet out, the slightly green edges of the cab. And so Cinso was always a very important partner. And I think it's great. Uh, the Mullen used to do uh, a bit of Cinso back into their, um, their cab. They're bottling the Cinso on its own as well now. Um, La Riche, uh, the Richesse, that blend that uh, the Larishas are putting together, Etienne and Christo, uh, that's got a big whack of Cinso in it. So Cinso, I think, can be a valuable tool. It can bring a bit of perfume. It can also bring a bit of elegance, especially to some of the Cabernets that are maybe in our climate and our situation, reaching maturity at higher potential alcohol levels. Yeah, you 14, 15 sides of the world. You know, Cinso usually ripens up physiologically at much lower potential alcohol, sort of the 11 and a half, 12 and a half percent side. So maybe a small bit of Cinso can also be a great tool to lift the perfume notes and help balance a, a warm alcohol. So I think Cinso is a possibility and it, it shouldn't be ignored, but you've also got to make sure that it's good quality. You're just not using it because it's cool, that it is good and high quality first and foremost. We also have... The... Oh. Okay. Yeah, that was awesome. Okay, cool. cool. We also have a question from Carol. So Carol wanted to know if you could describe the MCC process. So you guys do MCC, and so um, Method Cape Classic. So can you explain that for us, please? Yes, I can. I hope you don't mind. I'm, I've, I've got this bottle sitting next to me, and uh, I'm getting thirsty with all this talking. <laughs> So I'm just you know, going to get something working while we edit. I do mine because I would love a glass of that right now. But no, go ahead. Go for it. So jealous. So jealous. <laughs> so I should go get a bottle of MCC if I'm going to do this. Oh, my goodness. But it's a bit gray and cold. So this will be my dinner wine later tonight. So it'll Lovely. give it a bit chance to get a bit of air. So MCC. We should have Lisa Marie, my... Uh, one winemaker on, she specializes in the stuff. Uh, method Cup Classique or Method Champenois as the rest of the world would refer to it as, uh, is essentially using the traditional method of making champagne. Um, we're not allowed to use champagne. It's a geographic and process specific um, uh, denomination. So champagne has to be made in champagne, port has to be made in Porto under certain rules, etc. We're obviously not there. and. Again, I think the champagne category, sparkling wine category has exploded globally, but in South Africa has picked up great pace over the last decade. And we are making some amazing, amazing Cup for Six. Um, and we referred to Bubbles Ferreira early on. I mean, he is, is without a doubt, I think our, our sort of standard bearer for, for what we do. Um, there are a lot of amazing sparkling wines, but he really sort of, gave it the big impetus, him and, and uh, Simonsek, I suppose, Simonsek being the first to their Carps of Funkel. I still think it's a great name, great brand, great branding, um, and they make great wines too. But, you know, between Bubbles and a few others, they've really pushed the category along. Um, sparkling wine, and I'm going to give you a quick 101 on the process, um, and fire questions if I'm missing anything out. You basically make a base wine. Um, and a base wine is uh, at a lower alcohol level and a higher acidity. Any sparkling wine, any champagne that you've had, it's got lots of fresh acidity and it doesn't have a too dominant alcohol. If you've got too much alcohol uh, with uh, gassy wine, it will become very unpleasant to drink. So when you've got any sort of level of sparkle in, a, in, in an alcoholic beverage, you don't want too much alcohol because it's not going to find a balance. So nice fresh acidity, low alcohol. And you make a wine just like you would normally harvest, um, where normal white wine production, you're picking on a sugar level of 20 to 23 bricks or balling, uh, which is just a measure of the sugar. Um, uh, your sparkling wine is all south of 20. In fact, most of the time we, we harvesting between about 17 and a half up to about 19, sometimes they keep a bit past 19 on us, but generally we try to get them in under 19 uh, balling. 
And that'll give us a base wine of a, maybe an alcohol of about 10 and 11%. 11%. Once that base wine is now finished fermentation, uh, and this is where the, the techniques and the styles of each producer start coming in, um, you can then bottle it again, or you bottle the wine with some yeast, uh, fresh yeast, and some more sugar. And then you put it in a bottle and yeah, I've actually got a bottle in my cupboard. No, this is the one I'm actually looking for. I don't know what it is. It's it's got a can you guys see what I got here? It's a sparkling sparkling wine. It doesn't have any yeast in it, so I'm not sure what it is, where it's come from, but I I saw it. You can see it's got a beer bottle cap on. So you take the wine that you've made and you bottle it and you put a bit of yeast and a bit of sugar and you put a beer bottle cap on. That's why all MCC bottles you'll see have a lip on them. They're not a straight sided lip. They've got a lip so that they can take a crown seal or a beer bottle cap type style closure. And you go through a secondary fermentation in the bottle. Now all the fermentation is, it is yeast cells, they're little living organisms surviving and they need food and they utilize and they metabolize sugar or the sugars that you've now added or naturally occurring in the grapes as a food source and they eat the sugar and the byproducts of that process are carbon dioxide and alcohol so now in our bottle of sparkling wine we're going through a second refermentation the amount of sugar we add is very precise because if you add too much sugar you can have too many bubbles and the bottle's going to explode. If you have too little sugar, you're not going to have enough bubbles and you're going to have a fairly flat sparkling wine. So we add quite a specific amount of sugar to get a certain amount of bubbles or we measure it in pressure in the bottle. And it goes through the fermentation process. The carbon dioxide that is produced, obviously there's a little bit of alcohol produced. The carbon dioxide that is produced during that alcoholic fermentation can't escape. There is a cap on the bottle. Uh, when we ferment in a tank, you know, there's a vent at the top of the tank, so the gas escapes. Yeah, it can't escape. And so the carbon dioxide is forced to dissolve into the wine. And that's where you get your carbonation from. It's a very natural and very, well, obviously old process. But if you think about at home, if you've got a stream soda machine, you take water without any gas in it and you force it under pressure to dissolve carbon dioxide. You bubble that carbon dioxide into the water. It can't escape, so it dissolves into the water and you've got bubbly water. This is what happens here. Your carbon dioxide from fermentation is forced into solution and you've got bubbles in your wine. What you then do have is you've got a bottle with a whole lot of yeast and I wish I had one with yeast in it, but a whole lot of yeast floating around it. And the yeast is floating all over. So what you do is you put it into a riddling rack the riddling rack will hold the bottle like this. So you can see my hand holding it. It holds it like that and you get a layer of yeast at the bottom of the bottle. And then you'll start turning the bottle. So in a clockwise sort of fashion, it doesn't have to be clockwise, but it's the easier way to go. And you turn it and eventually you'll start turning it upwards. So this layer of yeast will gather in the bottom of the bottle. I do have yeast in here. You won't be able to see it's getting cloudy, but there it is. This is an unriddled bottle. And you turn it and eventually it'll sit in the, the riddling racks upside down like this. And all the yeast will settle into the neck of the bottle. You take that and you put it onto now the degorging line. The degorging line is the process of removing the yeast from the bottle. And it goes on, it goes into a bath of uh, glycol at usually at about minus 12 degrees. It freezes the neck. So now you turn it back upside down the wine's under pressure, you'll have a plug, like a cork of yeast, frozen yeast, stuck at the top of the bottle. You take the beer bottle cap off, the pressure shoots the frozen plug of yeast out of the bottle, and you top it up with a dosage, and you put your cork in, you put your musolet on, and you've got your bottle of sparkling wine. It's fairly... It's, well, it's quite an involved process, but it is actually quite a simple process. Nice. Thank you so much. Does that answer your question, Carol? It does. Thank you very much, Alistair. Uh, but your MCC, particularly mm. for me, is incredibly fresh mm. and sophisticated. Um, it's one of my favorites. Mm. 
And I was wondering what, um, as part of your, your riddling process, do you use gyro pallets firstly? And secondly, how much time on the secondary lees does your MCC sit before degorgement? Yeah, cool. I mean, obviously, I, 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 I think all. MCC is quite a popular category or sparkling wine. Product. I love champagne. Um, and, you know, it, it's something that's coming back in the region of champagne too. And it's something we've done from day one on all our, our sparkling wines. We make three. We make a non-vintage brut. We make a non-vintage brut rosé. And then we make a vintage wine. And, and the, the technique on the, between the non-vintage and the vintage is slightly different. But one thing we've said, and again, and it, it almost refers back to my my shannon discussion and why we started using amphora and where we i love freshness and minerality in wines but especially when it comes to white and 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 sparkling wine and champagne is most probably the most guilty category for, for this is that for freshness they sacrifice texture and that's part of that lease aging process well we've got a lot of acidity a lot of freshness and you need to balance it out build texture and in the modern world you know, again, we're a consumer-driven society. We want uh, wines to open now, and we want value for money. So we looked at Kleiner Zolsa. On our vintage, uh, we do three to four years on lease after the, the secondary fermentation before we riddle and degorge. Um, and then we'll give it another year under cork. We are are the, the maturation on the cork for that wine is very important as well. You get a lot of texture to balance it all out there. On our two non-vintages, as well as components of the vintage, we go through before we bottle for the second alcoholic fermentation, we go through full malolactic fermentation. It's the only whites that go through malolactic fermentation at, at, at Kleiner Zolza. And for those of you that are not familiar what malolactic is, it's the conversion of malic acid into lactic acid. To make that process simple, what we're trying to achieve with that, the Afrikaans wording is, is more illustrative. Uh, it's apple melts you Apple acid is converted into milk acid. If you think about biting into a Granny Smith apple, beautiful, fresh, tart Granny Smith. I love Granny Smiths, but it's tart and it's fresh and it's bright. If you think about have, sipping on a glass of milk, it's soft and creamy, still fresh, but it's soft and creamy. So that's what we're achieving by going through malolactic fermentation. So our base wines go through malolactic fermentation. So we're harvesting fairly early. Like I said, between 17, 17 and a half and up to about 19. That's very low alcohol, very fresh acidities. Um, and that's unfortunately, I think, where some guys in their rush to make you know, the process faster and a bit quicker, they go straight to bottle and they don't do any malolactic and they get these very fresh, very lean wines. Uh, and then I have to add a lot of sugar back at Dussage to find that balance and that, that elegance without being too acidic and too harsh. Because we take, and the process takes about six months on sparkling wine, we, our non-vintages go through a secondary fermentation, the malolactic fermentation, and we build a bit of texture there, as well as they have six months on their primary fermentation leaves while they're going through uh, the, the malolactic fermentation. So our base wines are a little bit, richer than most people's base wines and i think that's really important when especially on the vin the non-vintage side of things our wines a lot of people say yeah they're so fresh and so bright but but they still got a lot of flavor they got a lot of intensity and i think it's that combination of doing malolactic fermentation uh as well as then you know working on the dosage to get that that balance and those non-vintage wines are between 12 and 14 months on lees uh depending on 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 the batch that we're doing it'll be about 12 to 14 months on lease. I think that Thank answers you. most of the questions. Is that about right? Yeah, I think that was all of our questions. We have another question from Ian, so I am going to unmute Ian so he can ask his question. Hello, hello. So go ahead. Welcome. Yeah, I just wanted to find out, um, I mean, I am the PR guy for Trainers Alter, but actually I'm still quite, um, what, what's coming up? Uh, as new releases uh, from Kleiner Zelta once we're over this lockdown era. Is anything exciting coming on shelf uh, post this phase? 
Um, Ian, yes, I, I, I hope so. Let's put it that way. You, you, you know Quivis, you've been working Quir with Quivis longer than I have. So yeah. he's got his own way of deciding on when and where and how. But obviously, I think we've touched on the, the whole Amphora uh, project. Um, yeah. And through that, we've bottled quite a few wines in, in super limited quantities. I'm talking you know, a few hundred bottles here and maybe up to a thousand bottles there um, of wines that we thought held special interest. Not, they were not just you know, different, they, they, they were different and super high quality. And we'd love to release those in very sort of limited quantities, specifically through into the on-trade. I think, you know, if you look at the, you know, I think it's the dining scene, I know better, but Cape Town and whatnot, if you look at the beautiful, eclectic, small, focused wine list, this is what they're screaming out for, these eclectically focused wines. And I talked about an Amphora fermented Shiraz or for Shale Vineyard in Stellenbosch. You, know, you don't get too much more unique than that. Um, and, and, and the wine is not just geeky, it is high quality, very, very exciting stuff. I suppose a, a few of those wines hopefully will be released. Uh, we are working on some sort of ideas and you know, Kleiner Salza has a very specific, very loyal and very defined brand identity at the moment. And these wines are a little bit left field, so to speak. Um, if you look at our current brand styling and, and wine styling. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to be able to release these without diluting our current message and or competing, cross competing with our current message. So there are a few exciting wines. And then one wine that sort of slipped onto the market without really anyone taking notice. And, and, and it's sad for me because it's one of my favorite grape varieties is Grenache. We've got a I got my hands onto an older parcel. It's a 40-year-old parcel of very old clone Grenache out of, out of uh, Darling. Uh, it's actually a parcel that I, I, I sort of knew about when I worked there, but I couldn't get my hands on at the time. And so we've launched in the vineyard selection, the Black Label range, we've mm. launched this beautiful Grenache, which is, is a very light, very fresh style. Because it's old clone, it has very little color. It's almost like a deep rosé in color, but it's a red wine but it's super fresh floral, that very, yeah, you know, someone talked about Sinso early on. It's almost got a Sinso-esque perfume to it. Uh, it's a very unique wine. It retails at our cellar door for 149 Rand a bottle. Um, it is, it's, it's world-class Grenache in a certain styling. We hardly sell any of it from our cellar door because the people that come to our cellar door want traditional kind of souls of wines. They don't mm. particularly want this sort of Grenache-y funny wine, but, the people in the know, and funny enough, are Japanese agents. And if you think about Japan and their style of food and the style of wines that do very well there, they love the Grenache. They are number one client for this Grenache because it's the, the style of wine that they're loving. So that has been released. It's just something that someone doesn't know about. There are a couple of things. And, you know, again, our current uh, range of wines, our family reserve wines are evolving and they are yeah, the Cabernets have really taken a huge jump up in elegance. The Shenons, with the Amphora now being blended as a component back into them, also have shown a, an elegance and a freshness that they've never seen before. And, you know, RJ, our head winemaker, is you know, he's the chairman of the Sauvignon Blanc Association of South Africa. He loves Sauvignon Blanc. He comes out of, he, he's, his schooling is out of Durbanville. And our family reserve Sauvignon is also evolving into something quite exciting. You know, again, we're starting to look at alternative fermentation techniques. We've got a parcel of Sauvignon Blanc in Amphora this year. We've got a parcel of Sauvignon Blanc in, in, in barrel ferment this year. It's not to say they will definitely be in the family reserve range, but the, the evolution at Kleiner Salza, the, the wines that are waiting in the wings, not necessarily just new branding or new varieties, but even the the old established Kleiner Zolza portfolio is going through a, a I don't want to say a dramatic re re evolution, but a, a, a subtle evolution, but an exciting evolution at the moment. And those wines are all starting to hit the market now. Great, sounds really interesting. So I think Silas, he had a question. He wanted to ask directly, so I'll unmute you, Silas. What's your question? Hello, uh, Alistair. Uh, I have this question about sustainability of some of the grapes in South Africa in the wake of the global warming. You realize mm. that uh, you go to conferences and everybody is talking about the impact of the global warming. And of course, I've looked at the approach that the clients also is taking, you know, trying to 
across grapes from all over the Western Cape and perhaps utilizing grapes with uh, drought resistance like the Grenache that we just talked about, the Shirazis of the day and stuff like that. Like that. Sure. So is this an approach that you're looking, um, you know, in consideration of uh, what we, the world is looking at, the global warming, on uh, if yeah, you're absolutely. feeling the heat of the global warming in any way, and what is the future, what does the future look like? Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's a, it's a, it's a tough one to answer. It's, you know, you, with global warming, you know, the, the, the fact of temperatures rising is not the only in fact, in fact, in Stellenbosch, I think what we're seeing more uh, as, as, a, as an indicator of the changing climate, and yes, it's generally warming, is our rainfall. Our rainfall has been far more erratic, and I know we've had a drought, but let's see, even if we, we dismiss the drought for now, the, the, the timing of our rain, we're getting much more rain in spring than we've ever got before, and we're getting more consistent rain events during the growing season, late spring, early summer, right into harvest now, you know, where it used to be once in an absolute blue moon, you get a, a big rain event in the harvest. It's almost, it's almost every year now, since I've been at Kleiner's also at least, we've had significant rain during the harvest period. Uh, and we've had a lot more rain events, less rain in winter, but more rain spread out over the whole growing season, which poses its challenges from a health point of view, mildew and and other problems that might be associated with a lot of moisture in, in that growing period. But where you're trying to do dry grown farming and, and minimize your reliance on, on irrigation, um, a, a little bit of rain in spring can be a good thing. So with the cons of rising temperatures, some pros can also be, you know, some positives can come out of, out of, out of that. We are seeing a change in the climatic patterns. Um, for example, we've just re-established most of the vineyards at Kleiner's Hulls. Um, you know, in the mid-90s when Quirbus replanted those vineyards, there was a lot of virus, a lot of leaf roll virus being propagated within the nursery system to the no fault of their own. The material just wasn't there and, 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 and the quality of the material and understanding of virus wasn't there and they, 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 they fixed it. The, the, the quality of material we get now is brilliant. So we've slowly replanted all our vineyards. and. What was really cool about replanting, one, we got to manage the best varieties on the sites at Kleiner's Olza, and we had 25 years of experience of what works best on the site. But the other big thing we looked at is at rootstock management. And a lot of people look at drought and heat resistant varieties, Grenache, you know, whatever it might be. They, they, you know, some guys have planted Eschiteko from, from Greece on the white side, and they're looking at, at the, the resistant varieties. But one thing we mustn't forget is you've also got to have resistant rootstocks. All our vines are grafted. So it doesn't help to plant the most, uh, you know, most drought resistant and heat resistant variety in the world. If you're planting it on, on a rootstock that needs a lot of water, <laughs> it, it's not going to work. So what we also did is we married, we found the best quality rootstocks that will give us the best quality growth on the variety on top. And let's use Cabernet, for example. Cabernet, you want it to be a moderate grow. You don't want it to grow too vigorously. So you want a rootstock that promotes moderate growth. But some of the best rootstocks to promote moderate growth are very sensitive to drought and heat. So we had to find the best medium to get the best rootstock to give us the most moderate growth, but also give us the maximum uh, uh, drought resistance. Because we, the, the thing we see the most is we feel the drought conditions we've had over the last five seasons are more of a trend that will stay. And part of global warming is marginally higher temperatures, but you can deal with higher temperatures, especially in areas like us that are close. I'm looking at False Bay at the moment, where we get the cool air in the evenings. You know, I've worked in some regions in Spain where I'm far hotter than Stellenbosch will ever be and made some great Cabernet. But the, the main influence you're looking for is where you have warm temperatures, you have concurrently a big swing into drop of temperatures at night. And, and that fluctuation in your dineural temperatures, uh, and I won't go into the physiology, but it basically helps the, the vines preserve their freshness, preserve their acidity. And so in Stellenbosch, I think we're uniquely located, or we have the, the, the ocean influence is very, very defined in Stellenbosch. 
And so I I'm not too worried about the temperatures creeping up. I think the associated problems of when the rainfall is coming and how we deal with that rainfall and the overall lower rainfall is going to be very important. And for us at Clean as and I've mentioned it, the main focus is how do we manage growing our vineyards in a very water poor environment? Forget irrigation water, even the rainfall is going to be dropping. So uh, what are we going to do when we have no water to irrigate and we've got a little bit of rain? And that's how we're trying to plan going forward. Um, for now, we haven't made a major change on our varieties. Um, Cabernet and Shiraz are both fairly uh, robust varieties that can handle quite warm and fairly dry conditions. But it, like I said, we've planted with specific rootstocks and these vines we're planning to have in the ground for 40 or 50 years. We looked, what will the situation, what do we think the situation will look like 30 years time? And that's how we made the decisions on what we planted. Very cool. Great. Does that answer your question, Silas? Yeah, it did. And oh. maybe just, just to wind up, I just want to ask, where is the source of uh, the drought-resistant uh, rootstock? Where are they sourcing that? Uh, I mean, they are, they are it's, it's a global sort of, uh, you know, all the universities will be, be testing and, and trying out different rootstocks. Most of the rootstocks lineage actually comes from the US. It was the US that we've got to thank. I'm sorry, I'm not blagging on anyone on the call here, but the US was where uh, phylloxera came from. Uh, it's, a, it's an American uh, vine disease. And <laughs> when, when we... <laughs> And so most of the rootstocks that we use globally now are, are will have their parentage from from the the US because it was the American vines that phylloxera that it was the American disease, but the American vines over evolution had developed a resistance to phylloxera. So for example, when I worked in Spain, they would talk about their vineyards as P directo, P being foot, directo, direct foot, so it'll be the Cabernet on the Cabernet's own roots, or P Americano. Uh, American feet. So if it was a grafted vineyard, they'd refer to it being grafted onto an American foot because all the rootstock in the old days and then when it first sort of became commonplace came out of America. So originally America, now obviously locally we have large, large tests and uh, evaluations going on by the university, by the nurseries themselves of bringing in different clones of rootstock from all over the world, because now these, these have been developed in Bordeaux, all over the world, France, all the universities and, and places have developed their own clones and made their own trials. Uh -oh. And as we learn from everyone around us, our global colleagues, um, we may try new um, rootstocks. And for us, we were, were lucky um, locally between Vinpro and Vititech and the university, They've done extensive, extensive rootstock trials. Uh, and they've got like a it's, a, it's a very boring, if you need to go to sleep at night, but they've got like a manual and you can read through in great detail about the different rootstocks and the pros and the cons and which soil types are better for this one and that one. And, you know, as best we could predict, we chose what we thought would be the best varieties of rootstock for our site. Nice. Any more questions, Silas? I want to say it's fantastic. I, I like the depth in which, you know, Alistair is taking his time to explain everything. Thank you. Cool, man. I do too. I've been nerding out all morning. Anybody else have any questions? No? All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, do you have anything else to add, Alistair? Um, not much more. I mean, like I said, I could talk all day about wine and geeky things called wine or all around wine. But, you know, if any one of your, your members, guys on the call or guys that couldn't make the call, um, if there's anyone that really wants to chat about wine, uh, you know, you can send my number on and my email address on to the whole group. Um, I'm always available to have a chat or answer an email uh, about wine. And, and if anyone ever wants to come and have a look at my my terracotta army and taste a few of the wines you know when when we're out of lockdown you're more than welcome to come visit but 
you know, I, again, I'm on, the, I'm on the end of an email and a phone call uh, to any one of uh, you guys that would like to, to, to chat wine or questions about wine, mine or otherwise. It doesn't have to be questions about cleaners. Also, it can be anything. I'm, I'm, I'm a wine professional by day and a wine geek by night. I love it. All right. Well, I will definitely get your information out. You can also t um, type it in the chat so that everyone can just pick it up from there. Yeah, Otherwise, I'll do that. It out in our WhatsApp group on Black. Um, but thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you coming. I appreciate the detail that you gave for all the answers. I feel like I nerded out and I know so much more about co um, terracotta now. And um, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's a good pleasure, guys. Yeah, that was so clear. It was just, you have like very interesting images that you give for different, uh, the different explanations of the, the processes. I thought that was really no, fabulous. Cool. Like we've talked about malolactic fermentation, like how many times, Tuani? But that yeah. idea of transforming the apple, whatever it was, yeah. the apple taste to the milk acid thing. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. it was more concrete. Yeah, it was a good way to remember it. I can't remember the Afrikaans term though. Can you say it one more time? Apple, see, apple. Uh, apple, milk, see, husband. So apple is apple, milk is milk, see is acid, husband is fermentation. So apple, apple milk, milk acid, fermentation. Okay. Um, Apple milk seed custom. So you don't have to really worry. Just remember apple milk acid fermentation, malolactic fermentation. No, I love that. I just want to know, I just want to know how to say it in Afrikaans. I know. Can you write, can you write it down in the comments? <laughs> yeah, I will do. I know there's a word that starts with a G, but it's like, ah, but Afrikaans is, is still a challenge. It is such a challenge. I just just to, to let you guys know, I when I came to Stellenbosch University to study uh, winemaking, I couldn't speak a word of Afrikaans. Oh, wow! Uh, I'm I'm what to most of my colleagues, and it's quite a rude uh, term, but they refer to me as a soti. Um, a what? A soti, and I will not go into any explanation about that. It's very rude. Um, uh -oh. But most of my colleagues from my year at university don't know my first name. They only know me by my nickname. Um, uh, sure. However, uh, I couldn't speak a word of the language. And then the uh, viticulture professor, uh, the late, great uh, Professor Archer, who got me into winemaking in a roundabout way, um, at his 60th birthday party, uh, I was in from Spain. Well, unexpectedly and he invited me to his party and pitched up then most of the people at the party didn't know who I was and um, he said to his his his, you know, his his friends and family he said yeah I just want to introduce this guy who's in from Spain he was the first Englishman that I ever had in my class at university and I said to him I said prof you know you're talking nonsense here I, I know a lot of English speaking winemakers in the industry that went through your class long before I ever thought of winemaking. And he said to me, yes, Alistair, you're right, but none of them pitched up in my class without being able to speak a word of Afrikaans. You were the first one that pitched up and only spoke English. So it's, it's been a long road to figure out this Afrikaans language, but after 25 years nearly, I've, I've semi got it under the belt. Wow. Okay, there's hope for us, Tuani. <laughs> yeah. Five more years. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. okay. Thank you so much, Alistair. Um, I appreciate you. you joining the call. If you guys have any more questions, he put all of his contact information in the chat. Please feel free to reach out to him. Um, and yeah, thank you. And I will definitely be by after lockdown is over for sure. Um, cool. We are going to finish up our call. We're going to do a little bit of studying. I have some slides this time to help us out. So it should go by pretty quickly. We have about 30 more minutes. So Alistair, you're more than welcome to stay if you want. And anybody else can stay or you guys can like jump off the call. But we're going to get started. I have to go to my class. I'm sorry. Thank it's been you. great. Every time it's just better and better. Thanks so much, Alistair. Goodbye, everybody. No, it's a pleasure, guys. Take Cheers. care. Zoom. All right. 
So I'm just going to give the notes. Okay. I'm going to leave you. I've got a couple of things I have to do this afternoon. So uh, thanks for having me and uh, we'll chat soon. Bye. Thank you so much, Mr. Bye bye. All right. So um, let me see. I'm just going to share my notes with you guys right quick. Let's see. Um, where is the screen sharing? And um, here we go. All right. So um, can everybody see my screen? Oh, let me unmute everybody. Let me see. Yeah. How do I? Okay, I'm mute, I'm But you're not in presentation mode, right? You're just in notes mode, right? Should I be in presentation mode? Okay, I'm still trying to figure this out. How does it look? Should I change it to presentation mode? Because I can see you guys on one side and I'm just gonna go over the notes just so we can just okay. talk really quick about um, Cabernet. So, um, so like we're following the WSCT book and here's the book, it's the study guide and I'm level two and so um, um, I'm going to take level three so I'm studying for level two and level three because I just want to make sure I keep all the knowledge fresh in my head. So um, right now, last time we talked about Chardonnay, Riesling, and Pinot Noir. This time we're going to talk about Cabernet Sauvignon which um, Alistair talked about, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about Merlot. And then the next call that we have, I'll try to have a wine professional on here who's going to talk about some more grape varietals. And then I'll also have somebody from maybe um, one of the MCC houses so they can talk more in depth about MCC. So let's talk Cabernet. Um, I'll call Cabernet the king of the king of red wine, right? So basically, it's the king of all wine, especially red wine. The major regions that it grows in would be France, the USA, Chile, and South Africa. Um, the climate that it likes, it likes moderate to warm climates. The color, so the color when you look at Cabernet is usually medium to intense ruby um, to garnet. So it just depends on the age of the Cabernet and exactly where it's grown. Um, so of course, if it's gonna be a younger Cabernet, it's gonna be ruby. If it's gonna be older, it's gonna start to turn to like a garnet color, which is kind of like, um, and then it can also go into like a brick color. Uh, let's see, the aroma. So the aromas that are usually associated with Cabernet would be black currant, blackberries, black cherries. Um, it's very herbaceous, so you're gonna get some mint, some bell pepper. Um, they usually make it in two styles, so you're gonna have it as a dry wine. Um, it's not two styles, I'm sorry. It's one style that they usually make Cabernet in, and that's gonna be dry and still. Um, and then it usually does age in oak barrel. The oak adds a little bit of complexity and some more flavors, some more like spicy flavors to the Cabernet. Tannins are usually high for Cabernet. Acidity is usually high for Cabernet. Um, ageability, um, it does age. Um, it ages very well. And when it ages, it gives it this softness, um, complexity. Um, you get some smooth, um, some salt, vanilla, and clove aromas that you get after the aging. Um, the tannins also reduce after the aging in Cabernet. Any questions about Cabernet or anybody want to add anything about Cabernet? Nope. All right. And so then let's just move on to Merlot, right? So Merlot, and I like to give all these wines either a nickname that's like, um, like that's published, that's public, that popular nickname, or I like to make up my own nickname for them because that helps me remember how to describe them or to think about the characteristics. And I'll call Merlot like the middle child because Merlot is like one of those grapes that's always kind of like overlooked. It's never really taken seriously, but out of all the kids, the middle child is usually the smartest one and the most creative one. I'm a middle child. But anyway, so um, the major regions that Merlot comes from would be France, the USA, Chile, South, South, of, um, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. And um, the climates that it 
climate that it likes would be moderate to warm climates. Um, the color of uh, Merlot is usually medium to intense ruby and some purple. So the difference between Cabernet and Merlot is you're going to get those ruby and those purple colors more so than the garnet colors. Um, and then the aromas. So Merlot has more ripe strawberry, red plums, herbaceous aromas. Um, it has like some dark berry fruits too, but it has this undertone of red fruits. Um, and then the styles that you usually get Merlot would be like a dry, still wine. Um, description, so like it usually is aged in oak. Um, the body is usually medium body. Tannins are usually medium. Acidity is usually medium. Are you shaking your head, Silas? No, you disagree? Okay. All right. Acidity. Yes. And you ate softness, complexity, dried fruit, and tobacco aromas after aging. So I don't know if you were shaking your head yes or no, Silas, but did you have something to add to that, to the Merlot? I was saying my daughter got me distracted. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> she, she, I was like, no. It's she was doing something I needed to let her. <laughs> no, absolutely. It has nothing to do with what you're telling us. You're absolutely on the right track. I'm so sorry about that. No worries. Um, yeah. One well, of those moments when a, kid, when a kid does something on the side and you really want to stop them. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I've seen you across the room. Um, does anybody else have anything that they want to add about Merlot? Or Cabernet? No? Well, I mean... Uh, we I'd like to, I would like to say something about the Cabernet and just, you know, uh, give a Cabernet the name that is even there as the king of the reds to be a beside name because of the boldness that a Cabernet gives you. And for sure, it just sits right at the top of up there as a for sure. And Malo being the, the, given it the middle child, I always call it, you know, uh, the grape that you can always play, be safe with. So it is somewhere in between. It's always mellow. And so the name given again works back. Yes, I agree with that 100%, just because it's definitely one of the most boldest grapes. Sorry, I'm just trying to change my screen a little bit so that. Um, I'm just trying to get out of the screen sharing. Hold on for one second. Anybody else, while I figure this out, have anything else to add about Cabernet or Mer Merlot? Any characteristics? Nope. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, so then that's it for the study group. I'll let you guys go early. If you guys don't have any more questions or anything else to add, it's been so fun. Thank you so much, Twani. I've learned so much today. This was a great session. I'm glad that you did. Yes, it's so worth it. I had another class at 3 a.m. Monica was in that one as well, so I'm so tired. I think I'm just going to take a nap. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great day. See you guys on Thank Tuesday. You. So I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Yes. Look forward to it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for the commitment and everything. And Today was brilliant. Good. I'm glad you liked Good. it. Bye-bye. Very much so. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.